Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom with our host, Bob Olson, who will now introduce today's show and speaker. Presenting I Thought You'd Like to Know, a program featuring some very interesting people who have a message for you. And today, tonight, we have a a very interesting author, and we also have the owner of WCAT Radio with us, um, Sebastian Mahfoud. So I'm going to turn it over to him, and he can tell us uh, this interesting um, uh, atmosphere we have here tonight. Hello, everybody. This is Sebastian Mahfoud. We are at Saybrook Fish House in Rocky Hill, Connecticut. So you're going to hear ambient noise. Bob and I are having a nice fish dinner. I ordered Poseidon Adventure. He ordered uh, salmon. And uh, Keith is uh, on location in Columbus, Ohio. And we'll begin our show uh, as a dinner interview program. So welcome, Keith Barabee, uh, our author tonight. Why don't we begin by uh, you telling us... um, a little bit about yourself. For example, uh, were you a, a cradle Catholic? Sure, good question. No, I'm, I'm not a cradle Catholic. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, although most of my family, my I, uh, not my immediate family, but the rest of my family, cousins, aunts, uncles, were um, Catholics um, since, since ever I can remember. But um, my parents left the church at some point, I can't remember when, before or just after they were married. So I was baptized in a Lutheran church, but we didn't really go there, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, past, uh, I, don't, I was probably about six or so, seven when we stopped going there, so I never really got any of that. Um, I did get some Catholic uh, atmosphere because of my cousins and aunts and uncles, though, so, so yeah, I'm, I'm a convert, I'm a convert. So, um, um, I guess, uh, I have this book in my hand. It's Mary the Beloved, the book that you've written by Keith Barabee. And uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful cover. And uh, why did why did you write this book, Keith? Sure. Well, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, this book is written, well, since how far back you want me to go. <laughs> how far back you want me to go on that. Um, Mary's been with me since... Even though I didn't uh, grow up Catholic, she's been with me my my whole life, really, um, which may sound kind of um, kind of mysterious. But um, I had a um, this this will help explain where I'm at and why this book. When I was very very little, I I saw um, um, the movie Snow White, the the Disney movie, the original uh, Snow White movie, which may not at first glance sound like it has anything to do with Mary at all, but um, it struck a chord in me. Um, it really affected me for some reason. Um, I was probably about three, four, um, but I remember this vividly. And um, really resonated with me, Snow White, as someone I um, somehow t- totally was smitten with and, um, and fell in love with. What's interesting is uh, watching this movie now with my littlest daughter, who just turned two, she's um, somehow become just an aficionado of Snow White. She, she can't go pretty much a day without watching um, the movie Snow White. What I noticed, though, is that Snow White, and I've read other, <clears throat> excuse me, I've read articles, actually, about uh, Marian symbols in movies, and, and Snow White turns out to be one of these great Marian movies that most people probably would never have, um, have realized, but with my, with my um, Mariological eye, after you know, years of, of studying Mariology now, I, I noticed recently all of these elements in there. Um, she's, um, you, you've probably all seen the movie, so she's at harmony with nature, she's this sweet queen over pretty much everyone and everything, she's surrounded by doves, uh, at the beginning she lives behind a high wall in a garden, and there's a well, um, it's distinctly reminiscent of the Song of Songs, which is about Mary, and talks of her as a garden enclosed, a fountain sealed, so she's perfectly pure, um, in the movie there's a mysterious prince, who at the end takes her to this palace, in the sky. She has a sleeping death, but she rises when the prince comes to her. Uh, there's a, a satanic adversary in the movie. All of this adds up to basically this, this um, Mary image 
in film, although I didn't know it at the time, but looking back on it now, having seen the movie, I'm, I'm struck by the fact that this movie so affected me very, very early on in my life and basically set me up when I learned about Mary many years ago now um, to sort of have an affinity for her. Um, and my conversion really took place watching um, a show about Marian apparitions uh, by Ricardo Montalban. I don't know if anyone knows what I'm talking about. I think it's called Marian Apparitions in the 20th Century. It's on a videotape. That's how long ago it was. And um, watching it, I knew for certain I must become Catholic because this is the truth. And it was Mary who gently really led me into all this. Um, and <clears throat> so fast forward um, 20 years after I became Catholic in 1993, um, in, uh, in 2013... Um, no, let me back up. I have had a, um, uh, I consecrated myself to Mary at, at Franciscan University where I went to, to school in the 90s. And, but in 2013, I kept hearing, this was late 2013, I kept hearing this inner voice telling me I should consecrate myself to her as I never had done before. And it was very sweetly insistent. Um, I think my gut instinct is that this was St. Joseph. I don't know for sure. Cause I didn't hear a physical voice, but it was just, it's just my instinct. Um, and so I did that. And ever since then, um, things have really taken even a, a greater Marian turn. And so I'd already been studying for my MA at the time, um, just getting into it. But it, it took um, a distinct Mariological turn at that point where I was, um, I, I felt certain I should steer everything I was studying as much as I could into studying about Mary. So it became an unofficial specialization um, is really what happened. And this has grown um, immensely since, um, since 2013. And this leads me to, to your question. Um, I think it helps make it all understandable why, when I study this and write this book, um, I've really been brought to her, which is a grace that people get. It's, I'm convinced of that, 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 that um, a close relationship with her is, is a tremendous grace um, one I certainly don't deserve, but here it is. And in studying about her, I learned something very um, important. And I'm still baffled as to why we don't hear about this very much from the pulpit, for example, from bishops. Um, it's not to pick on them, but I do wonder, and so I pose the question, because St. Alfonso Figori and the saints tell us something incredibly important, especially in our days, and that is that true devotion to Mary. So, Really loving Mary not as an excuse to sin because one loves her and wants to be holy, wants to be one with her son. You know, if one has that true devotion, that it is a moral certainty that a person will be in heaven. And St. Alphonsus, doctor of the church, but even further, he says, if a person has a uh, true devotion to Mary, if they pray the rosary, wear the brown scapular, and he says, do a little more, which I take to mean you know, giving her flowers now and then, adding extra prayers here and there, <clears throat> um, maybe telling other people about her. He says, you will go straight to heaven. Um, so in our world that's so dominated by, um, by this sort of just sewer of evil that's sweeping people away, um, it was even bad in 1917 when <laughs> Mary came to Fatima. Um, it's much worse now. And so but yet we have this incredible promise of a moral certainty. So not absolute, but... Moral certainty is about as good as you can get in this, in this world. Um, that a person will be saved. Mary will save them if someone has true devotion to her. And hence this book, to um, bring people to know her more and thus to love her more. Um, and again, I don't, I, that also hasn't been coming out, I don't think, um, as much as it, as it ought to be because it's so very important, um, this devotion to Mary. So that's that's the really long answer, I guess, to your, to your question. Well, now, uh, <clears throat> what about the audience for the book? Who's the audience? The audience is really anyone from, I wrote it for about, I would say, um, it's a wide audience. Ninth graders, I would say, approximately, <clears throat> excuse me, up to, um, uh, you know, anyone after that age, but also for seminarians as well. Um, because I've, it's, 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 um, it's a combination of, as I wrote in the introduction, it's a combination of simple and complex. So there's something for everyone in there. Uh, even the simple lines do have a, a depth to them that certainly works with the other more complicated spots in the book. 
So it, it's meant to be used and read by a wide audience. So I definitely also want to make it accessible and usable for seminarians who are you know, studying to be priests, of course. Um, from what I've heard, you know, there's um, from people who have been in seminaries who are priests and you know, diocesan religious orders. It really seems that there is um, a lack of of um, Marian uh, formation. I guess would be the way to put it. Um, and so this book is to help fill that gap a bit. It's interesting that uh, we just heard Sebastian and I were just uh, talking about this before you came to be on the air, and uh, he he just ran into uh, some of your audience uh, this week, and he'll tell you the story. Well, Keith, it's uh, with great delight that uh, I, as the, uh, as the publisher of your book, um, am able to see an immediate impact of any book, of any author, on an audience that doesn't yet know that author. So I was up in uh, Rochester, New York, at a gala supporting the St. John Bosco School, uh, Chesterton Academy. And uh, a 10th grader, 14-year-old girl, stood up and gave a speech. And her speech was rather, uh, rather good, rather eloquent, and uh, elicited uh, quite an ovation from the audience. So as the evening went on, uh, people started to mill around, and she passed by my table. And I had sent 75 of the uh, en route books and media books up to uh, Rochester to, to uh, benefit the uh, school. Uh, when people bought the books, the school benefited. And uh, so I had a table of them. I had 20, uh, uh, about half the collection sitting on the table. And this uh, girl, her name was Paris, walked right past. And I said, Paris, you gave a, a great speech tonight. Why don't you take a book, any book, on the table for free? And she looked around, and she said, what do you think I would like? Well, I said, I don't know. Do you have any younger brothers or sisters? And I pointed her toward the Sister Philomena series, you know, the uh, mysteries of uh, Sister Philomena uh, and her nephew and niece, Riley and Delaney. And uh, she looked and said, no, I'm the youngest. And then put her hand on Mary the Beloved and said, I want this one. She's 14 years old and went away happy. And that just wow. uh, that just filled my heart with some delight. Well, and mine as well. That is that is tremendous. That is tremendous. It, it's it's a great cover. It really is. I think just the cover itself um, uh, draws people. And that's something that Saint Gabriel Pacenti said actually. And I, um, I think he's absolutely. In fact, I'm sure he's absolutely right. And that is that the more beautiful the, the pictures, statues, you know, images of Mary, um, the more they have a power to to draw people to Mary um, and to increase affection. So. Um, I just love the cover. I, th I think it, it came out tremendous. You guys did an absolutely splendid job with it. Yeah, well, we've got to give uh, kudos to our cover artist, uh, T.J. Burdick, who has designed all of the covers for the En Route uh, books. But I don't think it was the cover that drew her as much as the title, Mary the Beloved. Uh, this, is a, okay. this is a girl who, who has a real Marian devotion, and, uh, and she picked up on that. And uh, certainly the, uh, the title with the cover art, but um, it was the title. It was Mary. Wow, so, very, uh, good. With that, very good. With that being said, and we know how Mary can attract us and attract our hearts uh, toward her son. With that being said, I'm going to turn you back over to Bob. Okay. Keith, uh, <clears throat> one of the things I liked in your book was uh, when you talked about Mary in the Old Testament. Uh, what can we learn about her there? That's, that's a good question. Yeah, I, I go over that in the book pretty, um, I want to say thoroughly, but yet it's, it's not thorough in a way either because there's so much more that um, that can certainly be, be said about it. Um, she's all over the, the Old Testament. I think a lot of people don't realize that. They, they hear, well, Mary's only in the, in the, you know, the New Testament a few times. And that's, you know, that's really it. And it, it, it's really not true. It, in, in a direct way, yes, Mary's only mentioned directly a few times um, around 14 times in the New Testament. Even then, though, those 14 direct times are packed with, with um, amazing things. Um, but the Old Testament, too, is just filled from beginning to end, practically, with, um, with Mary. And like I said in the book, it's like God can't help but talk about her, which makes perfect sense, um, because he's had her in mind from eternity that 
um, he would not become man without this woman. And the saints are, are very clear, and in the Old Testament we see it too, that you could say in the sense that God is um, you know, in love with Mary. He's absolutely smitten with this masterpiece of his. And so we see it. Um, beginning, of course, everyone knows this one pretty much. In Genesis 3.15, the promise of the woman and her seed will crush the, the devil's head. That, of course, the woman is Mary. Um, but also, there's, there's a lot more to it in there, um, especially with um, Lady Wisdom is a key element. And it's really important in, in a variety of ways, <clears throat> not only because uh, Solomon or the... <clears throat> <clears throat> excuse me, I have allergies, I'm terribly sorry. Uh, the weather's just been strange. Um, or the Solomonic author, which I'm not sure who wrote some of those, but um, it's all the Solomonic literature. So it's all under the Solomon name. Um, he's very clear um, in not only describing who she is in some very intriguing ways, but he also speaks of, of how one should fall, basically fall in love with Lady Wisdom and he says he wants to marry Lady Wisdom, and he's, he sets up the example throughout, um, throughout his literature. Proverbs, for example, um, the Book of Wisdom, Ecclesiasticus, how he wants to, um, to find this one. He wants to find Lady Wisdom. He wants to live with Lady Wisdom, and he even says he wants to, to marry Lady Wisdom. Um, and so this is throughout those, um, those wisdom books, the wisdom literature, and for example, in, in Sterak, uh, Ecclesiasticus, in um, the Douay Reims version, um, he describes a relationship with Mary like this. He says, Mother like she will meet him, like a young bride she will embrace him. Which is intriguing because he's speaking again about this woman he wants to marry, but also how she's like a mother. So this is meant, of course, in a, you know, in, in a spiritual, mystical sense. Um, but then he even describes very interesting thing in Proverbs 9, and that is this meal with Lady Wisdom. So Proverbs 9, and he says that this Lady Wisdom is set up, um, these, her, she has a house of seven pillars, is what she set up, and the church understands that to be the, the church, seven sacraments, this place of the seven pillars. And she specifically has, for a meal that she's offering someone, she's offering bread and mixed wine, and the church further understands that to be specifically the Eucharist, the mixed wine because God becomes a man inside of her. So this meal she's offering people in Proverbs 9 is actually the Eucharist. So she's giving us of her substance, and her substance is the word made flesh in her. And opposite to her, again, you have this, um, you see this, this sort of marital theme, a spiritual marital type theme, because with Lady Wisdom, you have a, um, this intimate meal, right? And you go to her house and you have this meal, uh, an intimate thing in, in itself. But it's contrasted with Lady Folly, um, this other woman, this adulterous woman in Proverbs 9, and spoken of in other places, um, who is also offering a meal. And it's very clear that the intimacy she's offering is um, one of uh, adultery, is what it is. And so when we see... Lady Wisdom, in contrast to that, we see with Lady Wisdom a true spiritual but true marriage of a sort, whereas with this Lady Folly, this adulterous woman, we see what is um, you know, an illicit union. And so as they play off of each other, we definitely see that with Lady Wisdom, there's meant to be this intimate relationship which comes through um, the Eucharist. And so that's just one, excuse me, one aspect of what we could look at in the Old Testament and she's like a golden thread going through Scripture from really beginning all the way to the book of Revelation. I love what you did with uh, Song of Songs. Yeah, Song of Songs is, I think it's my favorite book in the Bible, possibly, at least in the Old Testament. And it's, um, it's not an act. Oh, oh really? Yeah, I, I don't think, um, I think we have to bring that back. Um, it used to be that it was known as basically the book of mystical union um, with God in the Bible. Um, and I think it's starting to come back again. People are really starting to recognize this. It's the, it's the book that's about dead center in the Bible, which I don't think is an accident. Um, with God, there really aren't any accidents anyway. Um, and, but it too, even though the, the bride 
is um, especially the bride is Mary and the bridegroom is Christ himself. But we're implied in that well. I, yeah, I spoke of that in the book. And I think it's, I, I don't think it's been said. In fact, a, a professor of mine, we were talking about it, and he said, he said no, no modern modernist or modern person is going to write about Mary and, and um, our union with Mary it, it pertains to the Song of Songs because just no one's going to touch that. Because the, the book itself is, um, you know, has a lot of strong imagery, but it's, it's meant to be taken in a, in a certain way, in a, in a mystical way. So even though it's Christ and Mary in particular, especially, um, and it can be seen in other ways as well, but one way it can be seen is that since the soul is in union with Christ, so you're, you're in union with Christ, I am in union with Christ, um, you know, in baptism in the Eucharist, we become Christ. We, we become his body. We are one with him. And so we share his relationship with Mary. And one of the things that struck me while I was researching this book, I was just reading it, and I hadn't read this anywhere before, but um, is that her, the bride in the Song of Songs, her lover is ruddy and white. Her, 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 the one she loves is red and white. And, and um, it got me thinking. Because we are also, you and I are red and white. We're, we're made white in the blood of Christ, which we also see in the, the book of Revelation. Um, the people that are saved are those who have made their robes white in the blood of the Lamb. And so somehow, in some mystical way, we share um, Christ's relationship with Mary. And um, a great author, Father Stefano Manelli, uh, Franciscan Friars of the Immaculate, his books are tremendous. Marian books, and he writes about that, about how we need to be, um, how it's Jesus that gives us his love for Mary, and that's why we love her so much. That's why we're so happy loving her, and he gives us his heart for her, and he even says that specifically, that we need to be Jesus for Mary. Uh, with Mary, we become sort of Mary for Jesus, likewise. So you end up really with this, um, another theme that I, I looked at a bit um, is that when the soul is in union with Christ and is therefore, by that fact, in union with Mary, what you have really is each uh, person, so you and I, everyone is in union with Christ, is in union with Mary, and you end up basically with this, um, I call it an, uh, an altar of sacra familia, so another holy family, in a sense. Um, it's like St. Joseph. So he's, the only reason he's in union with Christ is because of his union with Mary. That's why he's in such a union with, with Christ, um, through Mary. And so it's the same for us, obviously, in a different way, but, but um, essentially, spiritually, it becomes the same thing. We are in union with Christ because of union with Mary, and it becomes this triumvirate um, of the soul of Jesus and Mary together, loving each other, which I, I think is, is intriguing. Um, <clears throat> now, how is Mary our mother, and uh, why did she, or what did she suffer for us, uh, in that regard, right. That's that's an important um, an important question. Um, so I think a lot of people don't don't um, have a clear understanding of, and the book explains this, but um, they don't have a clear understanding of, of what she did for us exactly. How is she our mother? Um, <clears throat> to begin, she's not our mother in a, in a sort of metaphorical way. That is, she's um. She really becomes our spiritual mother. She really does give us uh, spiritual life. And Pope Pius X brings this out. Um, he says that in a mystical way, Mary carried us in her womb with Christ. And why? Because, <clears throat> excuse me, because, with, because Jesus and his body form one whole Christ. So Jesus is the head. We form his body. But no mother carries just the head. Of course, that would be really gruesome. So Mary, too, doesn't carry just the head. Um, she carries the head and the body, although in two different ways. So with Jesus, of course, there's no physical pain or anything, um, and it's a miraculous birth. Um, for us, there is, though, tr for the body, tremendous suffering at the cross, um, far more than the suffering of all the martyrs and the saints um, and, uh, it, it put together uh, from the beginning to the end of the world. It's absolutely um, immense. And <clears throat> so she's carrying us mystically from the time of the Annunciation. Um, and then she, at the cross, gives spiritual birth to us is what happens. And this is what's going on at the cross. Um, not only did she know us individually and personally, even the saints say at the Annunciation, she already 
knew us. Uh, but at the cross, she actually offered a son for each one of us by name, knowing each of us in our sins in particular. So um, somehow in some mysterious way, she, within, while Jesus was on the cross, she was offering him up, and at the same time doing that um, for each one of us, knowing what our sins are, uh, which would be a horrific thing in itself since, <clears throat> excuse me, since uh, what sin does to the soul is far, far worse than any physical wounds. So you pour acid on a, on a human body, it creates a really disastrous situation. But sin on the soul is much worse than that. And so what she's seeing in regard to each of us are her beloved children in an absolutely um, horrific state um, because of sin. And she's offering up her son. So that's, that's one suffering, um, which is mind-blowing, just, just that. But she also suffered physically as well. So we, there were no physical wounds. There was no rending of, of her flesh or her hands. But yet, um, because of her union with Christ, she actually felt the pains um, that Jesus did on the cross. So in her hands, she felt the same pain that, that Christ had um, in her feet. You know, the, the crowning with thorns, the scourging. She felt these things in her own flesh. So she suffered that way as well, but that increased her suffering in another way in that she knew what her son was going through. Um, anyone who's a parent knows what that's like. So, if, you know, you had a really, say, a horrible migraine headache before and you couldn't stand it, and then you're, one day your child has one, it, it's even worse in a way because you know exactly what they're going through and there's nothing that can be done except to, to get through it. Um, so she's going through this at the cross um, for all of us. It's, um, it's astonishing when you add it all up. It, it amounts to um, massive suffering um, for her. And sometimes women will say, well, I don't, you know, how does Mary understand um, you know, suffering in childbirth because, you know, with Christ she didn't, uh, she didn't have suffering. But for us she had, um, she had suffering that goes far beyond what any natural mother could possibly go through. But she's mother in, a, in some other key ways as well. Uh, I'll just is out there really quick. I told my students this. And there's always inevitably one or two who say, this doesn't, I don't understand. Because she really more our mother even than our biological mothers. First of all, she knew us. And so why is that? First of all, she knew us before our mothers ever knew us. She's known us for 2,000 years. More than that, approximately, she's known us. And so that's a long time. She's known us intimately, far more than our mothers know us. She gives us spiritual life, which is meant to be eternal. Biological life is going to, to have an end. She can also constantly give life to us because she can obtain for us the grace of confession when we sin. So a, a person is, when they commit a mortal sin, they're literally raised to life again in the confessional spiritually. And so that's what she does as mother, and she can do this over and over again. And, of course, the spiritual life in itself is far superior to you know, mere biological life. So in all of these ways, um, she had this, she's our mother, and she had this incredible suffering. And it's important to know because otherwise, I mean, if, if you know, someone suffers for you and, you know, just that we know what Jesus suffered, basically. We have an idea of that. But people don't really have an idea, once they read about it, what Mary suffered. But once you know it, then you realize this woman is, I mean, not only is she the most beautiful, the most pure, uh, the sweetest woman, she actually suffered more than anyone else, aside from Christ, has ever or could ever suffer for us. And... I think when we know what someone's done for us like that, it, uh, it draws our hearts to them. And so it's important to know that about Mary, just what she did for us. It's just incredible what she did. Thank you, Keith. Uh, very, that was quite a descriptive uh, piece there, beautiful. Just so beautiful. But um, regarding consecration to Mary, what do you say about this that people may not have heard before? Right. This is, <clears throat> yeah, there are more and more books coming out about consecration, which is good. And I actually have, uh, I talk about that in this book, and 
and writing another book that's going to, to deal with this and also the results of it, like how do you live this, uh, which is going to get into things that I think a lot of people haven't done, haven't written about before. Uh, it's something we should constantly ponder, I think. What is the nature of this relationship we have with Mary? It's, it's, uh, it's incredible. The more you study it, the, the more you find new things about it. Uh, because it comes from God, of course, so you can't really fully comprehend it. But there's, there are various ways that consecration has been seen. And probably the main way that people um, know is that of St. Louis de Montfort. So for him, it's... Now, I should have for, for all of these different ways, it's Christocentric. Um, but there's something that even St. Louis, I think he... he I wish he had brought out more, but I think he, what he had was for the... Um, I mean, his book is still probably the best model. In fact, I, I'm sure it's the best model of consecration. There's one tiny little aspect that he doesn't get into a lot, and I'm, I'm sure he would agree from heaven about this, um, because this is just the teaching of the church. Um, and that is, and a lot of people haven't heard this before, they do hear this from St. Louis de Montfort, that we, get, we go to Christ through Mary. That's, that's amazing, to Jesus through Mary is a phrase, and that's a totally true phrase. It's absolutely right. Without Mary, we don't get to Christ. She, you know, no Mary, no Christ is the principle. But this is the thing we don't hear, and that is that we have two ends for our eternal end. The first, of course, is God. He's our primary end. But oftentimes, and Mary is, is our secondary end. That, that's important. If someone's your secondary eternal end, that is saying an awful lot about that person. There's no other person that's our secondary end. Um, only Mary is. So. But what we usually have is this sort of linear idea of, okay, we, it's like going through a door. You go to, go to Mary, okay, you go through Mary, you go to Jesus, and then you're, you're in a different place, and then, you know, that's it. But really the way it works is when we go to Mary, we go to Jesus, and she forms us into him. But then we have to ask the question, what kind of person is Jesus? Where is his heart exactly? And so what happens, and of course, it's after God, it's with Mary. So what happens is you go um, through Mary to Jesus and with her to Jesus, but then it comes back around the other way. Once you're in union with Jesus, you also, you find yourself back in Mary's arms is the way it works because you're one with Christ and he is absolutely one with her. But somehow we never get that secondary thing. And so it, end, it can end up sounding, even though it's not meant like this, it can end up sounding almost like a, maybe this is just the, the philosopher aspect of it, but it almost sounds, it can come across like sounding like use, like we, we use Mary to get to Jesus, but that's not the reality. When we live Jesus' life, we actually find ourselves um, loving Mary more. And so that's, that's one aspect that I don't think has been brought out um, quite enough. And another one is that St. Louis de Montfort has this, it's called the slavery model of, um, of consecration. And what he means is, is not a slave in the sense of, you know, um, someone's, you know, using someone as a means to an end. It, it means you totally belong to someone completely. And you do whatever they say. And, but it's, this is a slavery of love, though. It's, it's kind of like, you know, I'm totally in love with you. What do you want me to do? Uh, you know, like how men and women treat each other when they're in love. They want to do everything for the other. They, you really become a slave of love um, is what happens. And so that's the sense he means it. But then you have Colby who came along, and St. Maximilian Colby, and what he said is that he has even, he thinks a better idea. He wants to go even beyond slavery. Uh, as, and he says we should go to property. So property is beyond slavery because a slave, you could say, still has rights. You know, like you have to respect me. I have rights. Um, you know, a slave, a slave could still have some of his own will and the like. Um, but a property, so if, if someone, if you have a piece of property like a couch or something, you can just do what you want with it or a radio or whatever. It doesn't say anything you can do what you want. It, it's completely receptive to what you want to do. And so that's even, it goes beyond slavery. It's a better, more intimate, uh, a deeper belonging, you could say, to Mary. Say, you know, you do what you want. I'm, I'm totally yours. I'm not going to say anything. But he also said if there's something, some word, some way of looking at consecration that will go even beyond property, we should, we should do it. Because you can't go too far. 
in loving Mary, unless you can love her more than Jesus did and, or, and does, and we can't. So we don't have to worry about that. And I think there is one, and that is the, what I call the espousal model of consecration, as opposed to the Louis de Montfort model or the Colby model. What that means is that like St. Joseph, but obviously not in a, not in a, a natural marriage, but in a spiritual, mystical way, we espouse Mary's heart, meaning, um, and this fits with consecration. So let me back up. Consecration uh, is a covenant. So at the cross, Jesus gives Mary to, um, gives us to Mary and gives Mary to us. It's, so it's, a, it's an exchange of persons. It's a covenant is what it is. And in that sense, it's very marital in that, in that way. It's, you know, it's a marriage too. I give myself to you. You give, so you give yourself to me. We live one life. But it's like that with Mary as well. It's exactly what happens on, in a spiritual sense. But what the espousal idea does is it goes from a slave to property that you know, doesn't say anything but just you know, use me how you want to I deliberately and actively will what you will because we live one life together. So we are, I, I'm, I'm we're absolutely of one mind and one idea, one will. So you're, a person in this sense is, um, is, act, is completely, I would say, taking Mary as their own, as St. Louis de Montfort says to do. I think Espelzo describes it more because it, it gets to this, um, this covenant idea of I am yours and you are mine, which is what consecration is. And it's a deeper way of living that. And again, it's very St. Joseph-like because for St. Joseph too, like I said before, it's, the reason he's in union with Christ is because of his union with Mary. Um, the Annunciation takes place after they're married. Uh, and so that's what brings him, she's the one who brings him into union. So that's what a spousal model does. It, it says, I'm going to will everything you will, which is, and everything is mine is yours, which the other models also say, but I think this goes even further. Uh, now, it's, it's, um, it's, it's very sweet, and it's also, it brings a soul into, I think, the greatest intimacy probably with Mary and beyond the other models. Not that everyone's called to that level of consecration, to that level of intimacy with Mary, but it does, um, I think, uh, go beyond property like, um, like Colby was was saying, so and it's not as easy as it sounds. Now, it's, you know, if you're saying "I will what you will," that means when disaster strikes, for example, um, we have one has to say, "I don't understand this, but if you want my house to explode, you know, if my house burns down, if someone steals my car, you know, not that I should do nothing about it, but this is your will. There's no reason for me to complain about it. I I want what you want. I don't understand it, but but there it is. And um, another element to this so that people often forget I meant to mention it earlier is that we often hear too at Cana Mary says do whatever he tells you which is again absolutely true but the part that we don't usually connect is that the last thing Jesus tells us is behold your mother the very last thing he does to St. John the disciple and to each of us in him is not uh, go preach the gospel not um you know, do this, do that. His last command to us is, Mary is yours as she is mine. Live an intimate life with her. Is what he's just done. He's just, it's Jesus himself who performs the consecration. He consecrated us to Mary. So we're accepting it. So in, in, all of these things are, are elements I have not personally read. Not that they don't exist, I have not read them anywhere. Um, and so the book explains um, some of these things. So, yeah, I don't think these have been heard very much. Well, it seems to me, at least out here in the, in the Midwest, there's an increasing interest in consecration now. With, uh, I think, one thing is that Father Gately's book, The 33 Days, mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're familiar with that. Oh, yeah. And then I have, I have a, a prayer group friends of mine out in uh, Defiance, not too far from you, it's in Ohio, that uh, their, their charisma, charisma is to go to parishes and, and present this consecration. And they do three or four parishes a year. So 
it's uh it seems to be the interest seems to be really increasing yeah it does seem to be and, and father gately's book is i can't say enough about it it's it's a great book and it's extremely necessary and he, it's just a brilliant book um i recommend everyone read um father gately's any of his books are tremendous we, we actually went to school together i don't know if you remember this but we we're at franciscan at least our time there overlapped a bit um we didn't know each other very much but um it, it's amazing to see what he's doing he, he's doing incredible incredible things and i think that's part of the uh the the times we're in where we we find really a um um really what's trying to be a culmination of attack um by the devil on the church on humanity itself um uh, really on the very foundations of humanity attacking the family which um sister lucia said uh of fatima said would happen that his his last battle is going to be to try to destroy the family and so what we seem to be seeing happen is some kind of um, final battle, I don't know how final it is, but um, between with uh, Mary and the devil and Mary is going to end up, like she said at Fatima, her, her, um, she is going to triumph and she's going to, to crush his head. One day it will be absolutely definitive. Um, she's already done it, but in history we'll actually see it, the devil finally um, completely put away, so to speak. Um, so I think that's why we're seeing this. Um, I think it's providential that we see this ratcheting up of of um, interest in Marian consecration, which I said, I said is absolutely essential. Um, there's just there's no way to even be holy. There's really not um, without Mary. It's just not going to happen um, because she's the, the font of all grace. Not the font of all grace. She, Jesus is, but she's given all grace to her. And so if you want grace, the person has to go to Mary, um, which makes sense. She's our mother. Um, how does a mother feed her children? Right? She... You know, she feeds them her own milk. And you could say that grace is Mary's own milk for us in a spiritual sense. And without that, we die. It's, it's, really, it's really as simple as that. Um, so, uh, and all the saints say that too. Those who are saved generally have a, uh, a devotion to Mary. Uh, she protects people from the devil. So, so, yeah, it's interesting to see what's going on right now with this uptick, um, which really began in the 1800s with... Um, her apparitions really beginning in earnest then. And so I think we're going to see more interesting things coming out too. It's interesting in that um, one part of your book uh, you talked about uh, Mary mixing the wine in her in her womb. Right. Yes. Yeah. That's Proverbs. Um. That's Proverbs nine, and um, it, it also goes. You find it in Proverbs thirty one too, that uh, that Mary brings her well, the the woman in Proverbs thirty one, basically called the strong woman, but it's clearly a portrait of Mary. There is no other woman like Mary. And there are very, various key elements that link it with, with Proverbs 9. And one of them is precisely that she brings her bread from afar. And, of course, the bread from afar is the Eucharist. Jesus comes from heaven. He is the bread from heaven, a true bread from heaven. And that links up perfectly with Proverbs 9, where we have the bread and the, the mixed wine, the Eucharist. But also in Proverbs 9, there, there are other elements that show us that that's, there's this linkage. And for example, the uh, herd the people who belong to this woman in Proverbs 31 are wearing purple, for example. And purple is the color of royalty. It was very expensive. Um, you know, not everyone could have purple, but for this woman, everyone's dressed in purple. So that tells us she's a queen, and when we're brought into this life with her, we too are, are spiritual royalty, which is a more true royalty than anything on this earth, because royalty on earth is going to go away. We all die in... St. Thomas More said, we all appear before Christ as, you know, what we are. We, we put our roles aside, and uh, we, we just have what we've become. So, but what we become in Christ is, and through Mary, is this spiritual royalty. So, yeah, there's a lot of connections like that. I, I, if you go through the Old Testament, one finds them more and more. I'm sure we'll find more and more as, as time goes on. Well, you certainly uh, opened our eyes tonight. A lot of things in the Old Testament, New Testament, all about Mary. 
uh, and how how he, she's shown there. How can people best live their life with Mary? That is, yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, and this is something I'm actually, this, the second book I'm working on is going to um, to really go into this in a lot more detail. Um, it, it's going to pick up where the, the first book left off, which is, in a sense, setting this foundation. And so some things to do. How do you live your life with Mary? Um, there's a lot of things that the saints did, but there are uh, two, well, let me back up. There's, first, it's, I would say, doing everything with Mary is basically what the saints did. It sounds like a lot, but a person can make this implicit intention. You, know, when I, you, know, you can even say a Hail Mary every hour. It's very easy to do. We, we spend a lot of time, it's just kind of wasted time, but uh, plenty of space to, to say a Hail Mary here and there. And um, a, you, know, you can think about her, ask her to help us with her, with her work, watch TV with her. Hopefully it's a good TV show that you want to bring Mary to. Um, you know, things of that, of that nature. Uh, the saints have all kinds of ingenious ways of including Mary in their lives, having a picture of her around, um, kissing the picture. Um, but there are two special big ways that are really important. And, of course, one of them is the Eucharist. That's the first one, I would say. And because it, it really unites us to Christ himself. So you receive Holy Communion, and at Mass, uh, John Paul II says all these aspects of Christ's sacrifice are, are present there. And that includes Mary's role as well. So when we go to Mass, we're actually encountering Mary as well, wherever Jesus is, she is. So when we're at the church, wherever there's a tabernacle and the Blessed Sacrament's there, Mary's there. We can't see her, but she's there. And when we receive Holy Communion, this actually puts us in union with Christ, of course, but his flesh is completely her flesh. It only comes from her. Uh, like we saw in Proverbs 9, it's, it's of her substance, it's her meal, it comes from her. And the saints tell us, various saints, uh, Father Manelli talks about this as well, that when we're in union with Christ because uh, his flesh is only from her, and because their hearts are so united, one finds oneself completely united to Mary as well, by reception of the Eucharist, because it does put us in such a union with Christ. And, uh, and unlike regular food in the Eucharist, it doesn't turn into us. We turn into Christ, is what happens. And so there's this, in, the, the greatest union a person can have with Mary in this world um, is Holy Communion, because of the incredible union with Christ, and since his flesh and his heart are totally united to hers. Uh, so, you know, I say that I think this, people should be if we really thought about this, we'd be flocking to Mass every day because we really do encounter both of them there. And, of course, when you receive Holy Communion, there is this real change that slowly it does take place. Then we have the Rosary as well, which is the second thing. And the Rosary is, I mean, all the saints talk about this. I don't want to repeat things that everyone already knows, but you know, St. Padre Peter talks about it, how important the Rosary is. St. Louis de Montfort has a whole book about the Rosary. And that's absolutely true, but when we think about it, the, the rosary is made up of Hail Marys, of course. And a Hail Mary, and this is why even just one Hail Mary, or a few said throughout the day, periodically, is really important. One Hail Mary is, spiritually, is the equivalent of giving Mary a flower, a rose. It's the equivalent of giving her a kiss. It's the equivalent of saying to Mary, I love you. Um, the saints say that when we say Hail Mary, she immediately greets us back. And so there's an exchange that takes place as well. So in the Hail Mary, even just one, there is, what happens is there is this intercommunication. Again, we can't see it, not usually, although it does happen to people at times. Um, but there is this real communication, this back and forth that takes place between Mary and the soul. So with the rosary, what we have is, and I, I asked my female students about this, you know, what would you, what would you be like? I mean, if someone did this to you, what, what would happen? So what I explain is, so you have someone come to you, and they, are, they have roses for you. Say, say a little kid. They have roses for you. Um, they're, they're giving you kisses. They're saying, I love you. And all my female students always say the same thing. They say they would just melt. They would just, they would just die of love right on the spot. Right? And that's what happens in the rosary. We're all Mary's, despite the the spells of model. We're all her little children. She is our mother, right? So the, the spells of model is obviously meant in a spiritual and mystical way. But so she is our mother and we're very little to her. And so when we go to her and we 
give her these flowers, these I love you, these sweet kisses. It just knocks her sideways, so to speak. Um, you know, she just it bowls her over like it would with any woman. And so um, even more so for Mary because she's, so, uh, she's so in love with us. Um, we know she's in love with us because she offered her son an infinite sacrifice, uh, you know, the heart of her heart um, on the cross for us. Even when we were, you know, even knowing what we're like. And so um, the rosary is the next thing. Even just holding the rosary, um, Father Manelli talks about this, how just holding the rosary is essentially the same as holding her hand. Um, so, you know, pulling out that rosary whenever we can, you, you hold it and remember it, you know, what it means and what's going on. And so all these ways, that not only does, it's not just a mental thing, like I'm remembering that, it really does, in, in some real mystical, spiritual, but real way, put us in this intimate contact with Mary. It really does affect her. She really is touched by it. She really does reply to us in various ways. Um, so this isn't, I want to make sure everyone knows, this isn't just, I'm imagining this. This is really the spiritual reality of it, um, which, again, should make everyone want to, you know, pray as many Hail Marys as they can. Uh, but because we're not angels, we do have to remind ourselves this is what it means. And so, you know, we have to keep doing that. But, but that is really what's going on. So those are my ideas for the moment, anyway. <clears throat> beautiful, beautiful. Sebastian, uh, any final words uh, you have for Keith? Keith, hearing you talk like this just blows me away. Uh, it's, the book is coming alive. And I want to thank you so very much for, uh, for your devotion to Mary and your uh, witness to us and to our listening audience tonight. You're welcome. It's my pleasure. Anytime. <clears throat> We've been talking with Keith Baruby, or Baraby, rather. Keith Baraby. And his book, uh, Mary the Beloved, that is available at uh, Unroot Books and Media and also available at uh, Amazon. And uh, we'll be back uh, next week with uh, another edition of uh, I Thought You'd Like to Know. And in the meantime, uh, may God bless each and every one of you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks again, Keith. You're welcome. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.